And so I think we try to like, we apply some of those dramatic um, situations or whatever to, to the, to the digital space. And it just doesn't make sense because there are so many opportunities for good things to happen. Welcome to the kingdom one podcast, where we grow the church together. This podcast is here to give you big ideas and help you get practical with the tactical. Here's your host, Nick Ovalle. Hey, Matt, welcome back to the Kingdom One podcast. Uh, love having you on and hearing your insights. Today, we're going to be talking about Christmas and maybe taking Christmas uh, outside of the box. And uh, I'd love to really hear your thoughts when it comes to online events, online engagement, and specifically Christmas as we are uh, you know, coming up on that holiday season. Yeah, uh, you know, a big thing that I've been realizing kind of through conversation, to be honest, lately is that uh, the church has done a good job over the years focusing on the in-person experience. <laughs> That's been our bread and butter. We want to make sure people have a good experience in their, in the venue, uh, in the lobby, you know, in the parking lot even. I mean, there have been, you know, I've, at least I've sat in meetings where we've talked about the philosophy around how to like greet people on their way into the auditorium and make it a, a, a comfortable place, a, a good place, all of those kinds of things. And so as I was reflecting on some of the conversations I've been having recently, I've been realizing that we have not really owned this kind of online experience from the perspective of how are we thinking about the the space of the user on the other end. And so we focused on at least the conversations that I've been in with regards to online ministry, online events, all that stuff. We focused on how do we get our stage to look good? How do we uh, introduce new elements on the screen? Do we take people out of the context of a stage, putting them in a living room? Does our band do a full set on a full stage or do we do, you know, acoustic stuff in the lobby? Like we've, we've talked through all of those things in terms of what we control on our end, but I haven't really been a part of many conversations where we've actually had a conversation about what's happening on the other end. What is the person watching experiencing? And then how do we even speak into that or influence it? And so over the last week, I've had a handful of conversations with different people in different proficiencies, all kind of pointing back to online ministry. But that's really been sort of the trend is how do we, you know, now thinking Christmas, how do we take this event, which is typically a very high sensory experience event for us? How do we elevate that when when all we're doing is online? And so, you know, with all the, the COVID lockdowns and stuff increasing pretty much wherever you are across the country, Christmas is going to be online for many of us. And so we we can't sort of dismiss this. I think a lot of people were kind of holding out hope that maybe we'd be able to be in person for Christmas Eve. Um, so how do we lean into that? How do we take how do we take this event and kind of throw it through the screen and and kind of guide what that in-person experience is like, but but not in our auditorium, but in their venue, which is, you know, their living room or their kitchen or wherever it is they're watching from. Yeah, and I think that means leaning into technology. Um, I don't know if you really heard, but um, HBO um, uh, Max announced uh, in partnership with Warner Brothers that all of their 2021 releases are going to in theaters and the box office. And that made AMC really mad because they depend on the studios to provide them the uh, the content, you know, for them to show. Yeah. And so I think that's a really uh, important thing to, to bring into this conversation uh, because the church is kind of like the same way that uh, we, we've put a lot of stock into that in-person experience, into the theater experience, people sitting in a seat. And this digital space is, it, it's still, even though we've been forced into it, some of us are still pushing back. Uh, I had a yeah. conversation recently online uh, on a Facebook group and I asked them, I actually posted a link to the article and I'll have that in the show notes of why HBO and Warner Brothers are moving in this direction. And a lot of the response was, we need to meet in person because that is the gathered church. And if we are not allowed to, we need to uh, go against, you know, what the United States, um, you know, government is saying. And, and I thought that there was a, a, a big miss in that answer. And so I would love to hear from you. Um, can, let's talk about that gap between online uh, and, and offline. Like, I think there's a huge gap there. And I would love to, to hear your thoughts around how can we bridge that gap, that sensory um, experience when it comes to Christmas? Yeah, I mean, I think movies are a great place to start because um, it's not that the, the, the experience is exactly the same, but the thought process is. So if you're going to watch, you know, let's say you're going to have a date night and you're going to watch a movie, 
and you're going to make it more than just a, you know, I'm doing some work and I have something playing on another screen, but this is going to be, you know, like my wife and I did this. We, we watched a movie the other day. Well, what did we do? We, we got popcorn. You know, I bought some fancy root beer. You know, she had a, a an ice co cold diet Coke, <laughs> like, you know, pick up some candy on the impulse aisle, of the grocery store, like, we made it an event. And so really what we were doing is we were replicating the theater experience, but in our own context. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot of wins. I think the first win is that we didn't spend $90, <laughs> you know, that's a win. But the other win is that we had the comforts of our home. You know, we had, we had the ability to pause the movie if we needed to use the restroom instead of like sneaking out and missing half, you know, half the movie or whatever. And so I think, that same idea applies when it comes to the way that we're engaging church. And so I get that, that the desire would be to gather in person. And I'm not, you know, I wouldn't necessarily argue that that's not a good desire or a valuable desire, but <clears throat> I think I would, I would say it's short sighted to not take advantage of the opportunity that we have because we're viewing online as a liability and as a negative when the reality is it actually opens the door to a different type of experience that I think has the potential to be just as significant or maybe even more significant. Um, I would, I would really, um, posture that our in-person experiences are, are kind of getting stale in the sense that we have, we've gone down a road for a very long time and we haven't thought through the, the, the need to adjust or to change the way that we're presenting things. I remember going to a church for the first time in many, many years where they had an overhead projector that was displaying the, the, the lyrics to the songs, you know, functionally. And I just remember how jarring it was to the point where I was distracted from what we were trying to accomplish in terms of worshiping. And so there was this really weird cultural I don't, almost rift that was happening because the church, that specific church, wasn't interested in kind of progressing and moving into a new way of displaying. Now, I'm not saying that if you're a hymnal church, you have to throw away all your hymnals. You know, it's not that's not necessarily what I'm what I'm talking about. But I think we're dismissing something that actually has positive potential to it. And so, um, when you think through that lens of when I have a when I have a movie night at home, I kind of embellish the experience and replicate some of the things that are happening. We can do those same things when it comes to church. And I think those are, you know, probably the most powerful example for me in the very, very, very beginning of this pandemic. Everyone was still kind of shocked as to what was going on. Um, and this was now, we couldn't meet in groups of, you know, whatever it was, 250 or something like that in, in California. Uh, but we could still meet in small groups. And so our small group networks uh, or our system was encouraging our people to gather as small groups because at that point this was the beginning of the pandemic nobody was you know, we were all worried about these huge gatherings but the smaller gatherings weren't you know we weren't scared of those at that point and so this group it was it was awesome they printed out the notes they got pens they had donuts they had coffee prepared and like they were legitimately replicating all of those kind of comforts of the church experience in the context that they normally went to church and I just remember thinking, that's so cool. Like, I wish everybody was doing that. But what they did is they took this like passive, we're just going to watch the service, you know, perspective, and they completely transformed it into an experience, one that was really a gathering. And so I think that's, that's the kind of thinking that I think we really need to be imploring. I think we get to, um, you know, the word that comes to mind is binary with this for me. We we get to, yes, this is good or no, this is bad. And I think that's really dangerous, to be honest, because um, you can you can call someone and edify them. You can text someone and edify them. You can have a have a had an edifying in-person conversation. Like th there's not this limitation on encouragement that that can only happen in person or it can only happen on the phone or it can only happen via text message. The answer is yes to all. I can send an encouraging note to my brother who lives across the globe via Facebook Messenger. Does that not encourage him just because it wasn't in person at a gathering at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning? That's absurd. And so I think we're really limiting the power of the impact that we have as Christ followers when we remove some of these things just because they're different and they're new. Instead, if we can look at them and say, what are the positive attributes? Or even better, I had a conversation with my kids about this last night. 
how do I love God and how do I love others in this environment? Whether there's a conservative leader or a liberal leader or a, a libertarian or an anarchist, I mean, whatever, like it doesn't matter who the leader of our country is in the sense that I can pursue loving God and loving others. And when those things become an issue, it's a bigger problem. And so I think we try to like, we apply some of those dramatic um, situations or whatever to, to the, to the digital space. And it just doesn't make sense because there are so many opportunities for good things to happen. And so I'm, I'm much more of let's, let's build our online ministry to complement what we're doing in person. They shouldn't be competing with each other. They're not threats to each other. They really aren't. If they're done well, they're not. And so that's kind of where I land on all that. Yeah. What I'm hearing is that all of us have a lens that we're experiencing online through. And sometimes that lens is going to color uh, the way that we actually operate online. Can you maybe speak to us about how we can extend beyond the screen and, and get into a room? Because I feel that's probably the most important thing is that we want to make sure that uh, our congregation feels the the presence of us, you know, with them and, and understanding that we're two or more are gathered. And even if it's digitally, we know that the Holy Spirit's presence is there. So can you maybe talk to us a, a, about um, how we can maybe make that shift from going beyond a screen and actually getting into a room? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I was in college, I was part of the student missionary union and we had this um, we had this challenge every year. We had a missions conference and uh, there was this this particular section was called global awareness. And what we did is we actually took over a room in, in a couple different rooms and on the campus. And we tried to replicate the experience of being in a different country. And so one of them that was the most um, probably, um, I don't know, it, it really struck me the most. It was uh, Burkina Faso at the time was the, was the country that we were replicating. And so you walk into this room and it's like, it's like a hundred degrees. They'd crank the heat up all the way. They had pots of boiling water in the corner of the rooms to add humidity. There were all these like plants everywhere. But like what happened is you get out of your, your normative, you know, kind of Orange County, LA County, perfect weather space. And you walk into this room and you're like, I am somewhere else. And so they really captured the the sensory experience of being in another place and so on a much smaller level for us as we're engaging in you know church by watching a screen what are the elements that you're going to be even talking about that have a sensory opportunity because i i actually think we miss this on the in-person experience in church as well we we tend to focus on you know how did the lobby look or does the stage have trees on it or not you know those types of things but i mean i'm thinking through think through like a candle lighting experience at the end of a christmas eve service um that's a that's a relatively traditional thing i think you know mega churches will do it conservative churches will do it liberal churches will do it it's kind of across the board well uh, there was a church that i actually read about last year who they sent out a candle to all the people that they knew that were going to be attending online so now in the mail, you get this little box, <laughs> you open it up and there's a candle inside. You're like, what? I, I don't, what is this about? And then you join the service and it's all right, we're going to do a candle lighting now. And everybody all of a sudden at home is like, whoa, I get to participate in a way that I wouldn't have been able to had I not been aware of this and also been provided this, this tool. And so I really think there's, there's three different levels that I kind of think through this when it comes to um, Christmas that's coming now. So the first to me is to provide a list of things that integrate with the service. And so you can keep this simple. You know, I think through um, a, pop, a bag of popcorn on the front end of the church service or make cocoa or have, you know, apple cider or whatever it is that you want to you wanna have as a kind of a drink or something that that is uh, kind of setting the stage for this Christmas experience that's about to happen. You know, grab a candy cane, whatever. Um, but then that's that's really kind of this easy way that people can can do themselves, you know, provide a list to your congregation for them to build this this box on their own. But I think this is where the church has a really interesting opportunity now to facilitate that. I think what if what if you were to build the box for them? And what if you were to have some of these elements as a little box that people can come either pick up in a drive through line, which by the way, is a super cool way for people to, you know, for church leaders to see the people of the congregation. It's a really cool um, energy for this kind of weird gathering, but still gathering, you know, in a, in a safe way and all of that. 
Um, and a lot of churches are doing this. A lot of churches are, you know, distributing food when it, you know, to people who are in need or even I've even, you know, read about churches or heard from churches who are doing like drive through kind of prayer lines where it's like, Hey, if you want us to pray for you, like just drive through, we want to be praying for you. And so that's a, that's another really cool way to kind of kick it up a notch. But to me, the, the purest form of this is when the message itself begins to inter, uh, to include participation. And so you know, I think through the lens of, let's say for Christmas, you're sending them a box and, or they're picking up a box, however you want to do it, but it has this little bundle of straw. And so now this, this verbal kind of articulation and description of, you know, Jesus being in a manger, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, this is like tactile. Like we can feel this. Um, you know, another thing that came up in one of my conversations was, um, a candle that smells like, you know, frankincense or, you know, even something like pine. If, if, even if the opening kind of narrative of your, your service is talking about the mountains or the woods or whatever, I mean, there's just all these kinds of really interesting ways that we can, we can take the concepts that we're communicating at home or sorry, from church, from the stage, those concepts can now be delivered into the home. And, and they're adding now this deeper experience and this more rich participation. I think, you know, a lot of churches have tried things where, you know, we want to have, oh, let's have a question and answer, or let's have, you know, the, the people in chat make a comment and then we'll talk about it from the stage. And so, well, I mean, that's great, but technology sometimes makes those live interactions hard. We had a, we had a thing, uh, we had a magician come and we live streamed it. This was pretty early on where it's like nobody was doing anything live. And so like, we want to provide them some entertainment or something. It's a, you know, s some sort of an experience that's a positive uh, thing to participate in. And we were interacting with chat and it's like, this is impossible because one of the chats was three minutes behind the other chat and it just got so complicated. And so everybody sort of gives up and like, ah, oh, there's no way for online and in person to, to work together. Um, but I think we just need to think differently about it. You know, put the same energy that you do into your lobby or your stage into their home. <laughs> what does that look like? So. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really good is to build out that list, get it to your congregation. My question for you is, let's talk about um, new people um, and specifically, you know, Easter and Christmas are the times where you just see a lot of new people come in. And I know for us in Southern California, uh, when it came to uh, Easter, we saw like uh, something crazy. I think it was like uh, maybe five or six times the normal amount of people showing up on a weekend digitally. And so um, to make this idea work and understanding that new people are just going to show up to, you know, your, your online church, how can they get that same experience, even if they're showing up like five minutes before service starts or, or maybe right in the middle of service? Do you have any thoughts for a church leader, or an online pastor to kind of help manage that tension so new people can be included in the conversation? For sure, yeah. I think so. What's interesting um, with uh, with High Desert Church, which is where um, a lot of these conversations are kind of happening, um, really the big positioning of this is that this is actually an invite tool. And so, uh, while it is designed to be kind of deeply experiential for everyone, um, the the real kind of driver behind it is, hey, I want you to watch church with me. And, and the invite gets a little bit more rich now to say, not only do I want you to invite or, you know, do I want you to watch church with me, but I'm going to build something for you that I can give to you that's going to be a piece of that experience. And so there will be, there will definitely be um, an opportunity for people on the front end to gather these things that they have in their home. So if you have some of these things, you know, go find them. Uh, but so it won't be this very exclusive kind of experiential part of it. Um, but really the idea is to be proactive about a more compelling invite. And so um, it's it's going to be the type of thing where if let's say we end up landing on we're going to produce those boxes ourselves, well, then we'll produce extras so that you can take them and bring them or, you know, you can take extras and give them to the people that you're planning on inviting. Uh, or in the case of a list, that's even easier. You know, here's the list of things that we've included. Now go and build the the boxes for your for your relational world. And so, I think that's that's another really kind of powerful component to this is that uh, you're positioning it so that your people have a really kind of a potent way to invite them to something that's virtual. Because I think that's the other tension in this in this season is that people don't feel like they can invite others to church effectively. Uh, but now all of a sudden you're giving them a much more meaningful way to engage this online service. So there, there will be, you know, th there's the potential of them being, there being some misses on, um, in terms of will everyone participate? But I think the fact that, um, 
that the the elements are optionally included, but it's not like you won't understand the story if you don't have straw in your hand, you know, <laughs> that kind of a thing. It's yeah, you're not you're not saying now put in this DVD that we mailed you to see the final part of the story. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so there's you know, there's uh, there's going to be those opportunities for even last minute inclusion for things like popcorn or cocoa, things like that. And so I think people can jump in and see that. But then I think you're building, you're also building an expectation of sorts. And so if every month you have a new thing that you're doing, or even if it is, you know, if you want to stick to just the big ones of Christmas and Easter, um, by having that first experience and somebody seeing the participation option, it just changes the dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that we've done at Sandals Church in the past, and, and we continue to do, is we make these things called Rogo Boxes, because the vision is real with ourselves, God, and others. And to start a group, you get a box, and there's a candle there, and there's these cards. And these cards are really nice, because when you when you uh, use the cards in a group, um, they have, like, you know, questions. And it's like a, a real with yourself question, or a real with others question. So what it does, it gets the conversation going. So for groups, this is, this is really, really amazing. And what I love what you said about the list um, is that if you start to combine these ideas of like, there's a list, I'm going to get a box, maybe it's a shoe box, and I'm going to fill it with those things and wrap it and give it to somebody and tell them, hey, I need you to open this. And there's a card inside that says, hey, come to our online service. Um, and one thing that's really important is that there's always a personalization that we try to do whenever it comes to our groups. So whenever we mail these boxes, based upon the conversations that we have with the person, there is one unique thing um, that is unique to them. And what that does is it shows this idea that we really care about about an individual, whether that's a group leader or if it's just somebody who's reached out and, from Australia and said, hey, I, I watch online. And so I, as a church leader myself, an online church leader, I would lean to having a list, sharing it with the congregation and saying, hey, this is a good opportunity to give a gift. And this is a gift that's going to last uh, beyond this life, you know, if people choose to accept Jesus through that. So I think it's really important um, as we, we paint that context in that story, people can see themselves in that story and see themselves giving that gift. Um, one, one question I have for you is uh, when it comes to groups and discipleship, what are some ways that we can maybe leverage a, a specifically a, an online Christmas service to make disciples? Yeah, I think, you know, there's two sides of it. I think the first is obviously there's the, this is the opportunity for some to, to place their faith in Jesus, to begin that relationship. And so it's, you, you can't become a disciple until you become a follower first. And so um, that's definitely an element of that. But I think the other side of this is, you know, when people have a relationship with someone else in their life that's not a Christ follower, they have an opportunity to present Jesus to them and really to be a, a discipler of that person. And so what I think I'm seeing start to surface in a lot of different online ministry conversations is that the online space provides a pretty clear pathway or pretty, I would say a low resistance pathway to an invitation. So the thing I've, you know, I've been saying this for years where right now, the way that the church is structured, if I want to invite you to church, you have to come to my church's location to hear my church's message on my church's timeline. And so that's a, that's a more and more complex of an ask every, you know, as, as the days go by, the rest of the world is not behaving that way. I can eat lunch. I don't have to eat lunch at noon. I can eat lunch at two o'clock if I want to, or ten o'clock. And so the 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 hard lines of of kind of hearing the message of the gospel um, are going to change over time because people are going to be wanting to hear a message at two a.m. Great. Well, we have on-demand libraries that can accommodate that. And so all of those all of those shifts are really putting a lot more power to use that uh, term in in the hands of these people now, of you and I, who know people who are far from God. And so what the digital space actually allows is it it gives me a tool to be able to engage in that conversation and actually begin that, that process of, hey, you should come to hear about who Jesus is. And what's happening now for me is as I am taking up that opportunity, as I'm leaning into that opportunity, the church now is actually giving me a, a way to become a disciple, to, to be discipled over, with their leadership, obviously kind of speaking into the things that I'm doing. And so um, it, it's actually a really interesting way for people to begin to kind of flex their muscle a little bit or to sp- almost maybe spread their wings and say, I'm going to lean into this this mission to, you know, into the great commission. And I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go out to my world and I'm going to represent Christ to them. And I'm going to invite them. And I have a tool now 
that gives me the ability to bring the church to these people. And so um, I actually find that it's a really, sometimes that first step is really, really difficult. You know, we find often that people will accept Christ and then they'll kind of be stuck for a while because there's not really a clear next step for them. Or the next step is, you know, in some, in some cases go on a missions trip. It's like, whoa, okay. That's like a little bit terrifying. And I don't feel like that's, I'm ready for that yet. Or it's study for four years. Well, that's like, oh man, okay. I mean, so I, I mean, I'll, I'll lean into that and I'll, I'll do my best, you know, but that seems weird that I'm sort of on the sidelines of ministry because I have to study for four years before I'm like qualified to be able to have a conversation. And so obviously don't throw people into the deep end, but what the online pathway is doing for the church is it's providing really these kind of almost low hanging fruit when it comes to the beginnings of the pursuit of discipleship for the Christ follower is I can now invite people and I can leverage the online space to be a very easy way to participate, but then I can come alongside and partner. You know, again, if I'm going to, if I'm going to go buy all these things on a checklist and give them to somebody, like that's the beginning of me uh, kind of bearing fruit in a way where I'm now leaning into the things that I'm called to do as a Christ follower to change my world. And so um, I actually see it as a really, really cool opportunity for a lot of people who maybe wouldn't have gotten engaged otherwise to begin getting engaged. And then as you start, you begin seeing, wow, God's really working through this. So, Absolutely. I think that's really, really good is to, to kind of talk about this idea that you're starting to bear fruit in the Great Commission, that we're trying to invite people in. And so that's very, 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 very helpful. Um, one thing we talk about um, at our church is we talk about how discipleship starts digitally. Um, and nowadays it does because people are, you know, they're, they're scrolling through TikTok and they're, you know, watching their Christian TikToks or they're, you know, watching sermons on YouTube before they even step foot into, uh, you know, a, a sanctuary or, or even to an online space. And so we have to manage that tension of like discipleship is starting, uh, you know, through a screen and we have to be okay with that. So I love, love the idea of bearing fruit in this time. Um this has been so, so, so helpful. I have so many ideas. I want to take this to some of my teams and some of my friends in churches and share this with them um, because I think this is a great idea. And it's something we want to probably implement quick. Um, so if you're an online leader and you're listening today, you're watching, uh, we would love to get you this checklist that Matt has put together. You can go to kingdomone.co slash resources. You can check it out there. Um, and Matt, I just want to say thank you again for, for just you know pouring out your wisdom and, and helping us kind of navigate these times. Yeah, I mean, we're we're all learning. <laughs> so, you know, this is uh for me, this conversation even is a piece, it's kind of born out of of a bunch of different conversations that I've had with a bunch of different people who are all kind of pointing to the same problem. And we're, we're, we've sort of been dancing around it and it just sort of has culminated in, wait a second, we can like we can lean into this. And so I'm excited because there's even more things coming down the road in terms of, you know, one conversation and I'll just sort of uh, <laughs> drop a little nod to it. But one conversation that we've been having is what is a watch party and, and how does that actually become a very, very practical way to identify leaders in your congregation? And so... I'm excited because I feel like we've been in sort of this trauma mode of, man, we got to react to a problem and go online. Well, now, all of a sudden, we've been sitting in it long enough, and we, I think we're realizing that this isn't going away enough, you know, anytime soon. So now we're actually turning towards that positive side to say, well, if we have to do it, then how do we do it well? And so that to me is a really, really exciting time to be a part of the church, to be a part of ministry. And so uh, I'm just, man, I'm just pumped that I get to be around people that are that are so passionate about pursuing the ministry that God has called us to, even if it looks unconventional, even if it's not the way we would have designed it. So, you know, some of these conversations are sort of turning the corner. So I think it's going to be an exciting time. Awesome. That is so good. If you're going to do online church, you should be doing it well. I agree 100% with that. That is so fantastic. Guys, thank you for uh, tuning into this podcast today. If you have any questions for Matt or myself, you can always go to kingdomone.co uh, and connect with us. Or if you want that resource, download kingdomone.co slash resources, and we'll see you in the next podcast.